Well, last week was Easter, and it was amazing, wasn't it? God was all over this place speaking to different people. And I spoke to you about how do you experience Easter as opposed to hear the story again. And I talked to you a little bit about what that looked like biblically. Well, today, I want us to take it to the next step. And I have invited one of the best speakers around to actually speak to you about that. It happens to be my son-in-law. <laughs> Dr. Steve Browning serves at a church in, in Birmingham, Alabama, Shades Mountain Baptist Church. And, and he serves his, his capacity. He's a pastor over what they call community engagement. In other words, it's his job to lead the church to engage with the community and win that community to Christ. I mean, I can't think of a better, you know, there's a heart-to-heart -heart right here. Not only that, he's, he married my daughter. And they brought four grandkids to visit us, you know, two little twins. They were waddling in here a little bit ago. So Steve's going to be coming in just a moment, and, then, and I want you to welcome him then. But I, I do want to give you a heads up, though. Starting next week, I'm going to start a new series of messages on developing a life of integrity from the, from the book of James. And so I'm going to start it next week with a quiz, and you need to make sure you don't miss it because it gives you an overview of the next three months because it's going to take about three months to go through the book of James to do that. But invite somebody to come with you. Because I want, I want us to learn not only how to live out or know what integrity is, but how to live it out. But today, I asked Steve to take my last week's message to the next step. Okay, once you've experienced Easter, what next? And Steve, he's been there, done that. I can't think of a better guy to come and speak. I've asked him to tell, him, to tell us what the God's put on his heart. So let's welcome Steve Browning with a big old serious set of welcome, would you? <laughs> Baptist, how are we doing today? Good morning. It's good to see everybody. How about that? Next week, come back to church, you'll get a quiz on the book of James, all right? Y'all better study up. Uh, thankfully, we're going to be back in Birmingham next week, so uh, that'll be okay. <laughs> it's so good to see you today, and I was thinking about it this past week. You know, 16 years ago was the first time that I walked through the doors of this church. It's kind of hard to believe. And I love this place because I've got family that have become my, my very best friends. And I've got church friends that have become like family. And so this really is like coming home for me. And we've made the trip now dozens of times from Birmingham, Alabama, down here to Sarasota, Florida. And really, y'all, there is no easy way to get from Birmingham, <laughs> Alabama to Sarasota, Florida. Now you're laughing because some of you know about Alabama. And when you think about Alabama, you think about dirt roads and big old trucks. And you're about 90% correct. That is the entirety of the state right there. So it's hard to get here, uh, there. But, but I get excited because we weave through all of these small little towns in Alabama and then in South Georgia. And then we finally get to Tifton, Georgia. How many of y'all know about Tifton, Georgia right there? Tifton, Georgia, absolutely. I mean, it's amazing. You would think that Disney is there, the amount of billboards that advertise <laughs> Tifton, Georgia. You know, Jesus owns the cattle on a thousand hills, but Tipton owns like the billboards on a thousand miles of freeway up here down on 75. It's crazy. But I get excited because once we get there, that's when we get to go up the on-ramp. I get excited about going up the on-ramp. It doesn't have to be that on-ramp. I just like on-ramps in general, going up the on-ramp. Because what other time do you have that it is absolutely legal for you to accelerate as fast as possible to get onto a roadway. I always get thrilled. I feel like I'm at the Daytona, Daytona International Speedway. They're waving the green flag over there. I'm putting the, the pedal all the way down. Let's see what this Honda Odyssey minivan can do. <laughs> Open it up. Kids are in the back seat. They got their hands in the air like we're on a roller coaster. <laughs> Best in the front seat. She's white knuckling the armrest, just bracing for impact, you know, like she's just ready for it. And then, of course, we always settle into a nice and law-abiding speed, just so you know, right? I want to tell you what we're going to do today. Today, we're going up the on-ramp. Because you need to know that, spiritually speaking, God has a journey for each and every person in this room that He would love to take you on. But there are a series of decisions that we need to make and things we need to do that can get us on that journey and help us to accelerate into the plan and the purposes that God has for us. And I want to show you that directly from God's Word. And really, this is a message for all of us. If you're here today, and maybe Easter was that day that you trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and you're brand new to this, you're going to find this message helpful to know what are those next steps that you need to take to accelerate into God's journey for you. Maybe you're here today and you've known Jesus for quite some time and you know beyond a shadow of doubt that you've trusted Christ. 
But, but you're looking at me right now and you're saying, well, Steve, you're talking about accelerating up the on-ramp, but I feel like I'm stuck over here in a ditch, right? And I want to, to get into that journey that God has for me, but I need to know how to get there. That message is for, for you as well, for all of us that have known Jesus for a while. As we go through the ebbs and flows of following Jesus, how can we accelerate and push forward the plan he has for us? Or Maybe you're here today, and, and just to be honest, you know that you don't know Jesus, and you're not even sure you want to know him yet. You're just here and exploring. What I would encourage you to do today is just to listen. You've chosen a really good Sunday to be here. Because what we're going to do is just preview for you what God may want to do in your life should you choose to trust him. So if you have your Bibles today, I want you to go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3 is where we're going to be at. This is a book written by the Apostle Paul to a group of people that are in a city called Colossae. And they're a church there. And this is a church that really wants to follow Jesus. They really want to grow, but they've had some misunderstandings about how to do that. And so what Paul has done is he's written this entire book of Scripture to help them understand how to get past these misunderstandings, but also how to pursue Jesus, what real growth looks like. And we've talked about this a little bit already, but I want to show you why I chose this patch of Scripture. So what was last Sunday? Good job. You get, you know, right there, gold star. You got it right, okay? You're doing pretty good looking towards that quiz next week, okay? But here's why I chose this passage of Scripture. I want you to look right at how he opens this up in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. It says this, If then you have been raised with Christ. If then you've been raised with Christ. What that means for us is this, that last week when we talked about the resurrection of Jesus... It wasn't just Jesus that got up from the grave, but that if you choose to trust him as Lord and Savior, that's your resurrection as well. Paul says that's when you've been raised to new life as well. I heard a great uh, quote attributed to C.S. Lewis this past week is this, God doesn't want us just to celebrate the resurrection. He wants us to have a resurrection of our own. He wants us to experience new life and following God. And so he says, if you've been raised with Christ, then watch what he says. Seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. God wants us to set our minds on where he's at. He wants to set our minds heavenward. He wants to set our minds beyond what was in the past toward what's in the future. In other words, first point, God has more for you. He has more. More for you, more than what this world has to offer. God has so much more for you. In fact, it's so much that he has for you, it can't even be contained in this life. It starts in this life when you begin a relationship with him, but it carries on and through eternity, forever. God has more for you. And then Paul talks about this, unpacks this a little bit more. He says in verse 3, For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. What are you talking about hidden with Christ and God? What does that mean? That word right there, we know that the Bible was originally written, at least in the New Testament, in ancient Greek. It's been translated into English for us to be able to understand it a little bit more. But that word right there, that word hidden, really means to be concealed or kept safe. In other words, there is nothing that can take you out of God's hand, that he has purposes for you. That once you've trusted him, he wants to bring you forward in this. He has a purpose for you. And verse 4 makes it clear what that purpose is. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. When Christ, who is your life. Do you capture that? Louis Giglio, in teaching through the book of Colossians, puts it this way. It's not that it's Jesus and me. It's Jesus and in me, absolutely changing everything. When Christ, who is your life, that when you meet Jesus, he has an incredible journey for you. He has more for you. September 30, 2006 was a very good day. I was standing right there. I was very nervous and I was sweaty, very, very sweaty, because that was the day that I was supposed to marry the most beautiful woman on the planet. I'm not worthy, but that was the day I was supposed to marry her. And sure enough, right through those doors, right back there, in walked the most beautiful woman inside and out the world has ever known. She came in right there, 
and her dad was, was kind of trying to draw her back out the door, couldn't quite figure what that was all about. But she made, made her way up here, and it was a beautiful day. We got married in this room. Several of you were there. It's a wonderful ceremony. Kevin Miller and, and Mike Landry, pastor, led the ceremony there for his daughter. And it was the day that we got married. And oh, what a glorious day it was. What would have happened, though, if after that ceremony... I just got my parents, and I said, well, I'm going to get back in the car with you guys and go back home to Eustis, Florida, move back in with you all, and I'm not going to call or text with, with, uh, with this woman that I've just married. In fact, I may date around a little bit more. What would that mean for me? I could tell it what it would mean for you. So Mike Landry would not be your senior pastor. He'd be doing a hard time for killing his deadbeat son-in-law. <laughs> I can tell you that right now. <laughs> what, it mean, what it would have meant for me is that I would have missed out on the last nearly 13 years of an incredible relationship with my wife who is more precious to me today than she was more than a decade ago when she walked up through those doors. I would have missed out on this unbelievable friendship that God had for us. Listen to me. Beginning a relationship with Jesus is wonderful. You never get over the death and resurrection of Jesus. You never get over the gospel. You never get over the day that you were saved. But it's just the beginning. God has so much more for you, new heights and a deeper intimacy. And he wants to show you so much about himself. But you've got to choose to believe that God has more for you. So, so how do we get there? How do we get into this more that God has for us? What would it look like for me if I'm a new believer? What would it look like for me if I've been a believer for a while, but I'm ready to accelerate up the on-ramp into what God has for me? What would it look like for me if I were to trust Jesus and begin pursuing him in this relationship? What I want to show you in Colossians 3 is four ways to accelerate on the journey that God has for you. Four ways that God wants to move in each and every one of our lives to help us to accelerate in the plans and the purpose on the journey that he has for us. And the first one is this right there in your notes. It's to find freedom. To find freedom. I've actually borrowed those words from a Birmingham area pastor named Chris Hodges as I was reading verses 5 and following. I just couldn't think of a better way to put it because it's really what Paul's going to talk about here is how to find freedom. Because here's the thing, for many of us, we would love to go on the journey God has for us. But we get broken down before we get up the on-ramp. There are things, there are sins, there are things that are tangling us up, that are hindering us from getting where God wants us to be. There are things that are stealing our potential, that are destroying our God-given passion, and that are breaking our relationships. When we get broken down before we can accelerate. If you want to experience the more that God has for you, you've got to find freedom. So how does Paul tell us that we do that? Look what it says here in verse 5. Put to death, therefore, that which is earthly in you. That's strong language, isn't it? Put it to death. It's like Paul is saying, you better kill it before it kills you. Put it to death. And then he lists some things right here, some things that we need to find freedom from. He says this, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Now read a, a list like that, and let's just be honest, that can kind of sting, can it? Because if you're like me, when you read that list, you see these are some of the things that either are my struggle or have been my struggle. Others of you, you say, well, I don't, I don't read my thing in there. I guess I'm off the hook. But you need to know that this list is representative, meaning that it's not exhaustive, that this is not the only things that we need to find freedom from. And you know whatever it is that God's been speaking to your heart for some time now and said, this is the thing that you need to find freedom from. This is the thing that I want to help you get past. This is the thing that we need to move past in order for you to accelerate on the journey that I have for you, the thing you need to find freedom for. So what do we do? Well, here's the good news today, that through the death and resurrection of Jesus, absolutely every single person that has trusted Jesus can find freedom in every single one of these areas in their life through God's power. God is more than willing to help us in that. Let me show you where, where, where this says this here in verse 9 and 10. These are absolutely crucial for us understanding this. 
Verse 9 says this, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. I want you to notice that he says in verse 9, 10, he says, have. You have put off the old self. You have put on the new self. The language right there in the original text really helps us understand that this is something that's already happened. This is a work that God has already done that we have to just now bring our behavior in alignment with what God wants to do in our life. That this is what God has done. We have put off the old. We have put on the new. So that then we might be renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. In other words, God wants to make us just like Jesus. I love what Max Licato says. He says, God loves you just the way that you are, but he loves you too much to leave you that way. He wants to make you just like Jesus. And no matter where you come from, this is the work that God wants to do in your life. You know how I know that? Look what it says here in verse 11. It says, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is in all, for Christ is all and in all. What he's saying is, it doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter what your past has been. It doesn't matter what your former religion was. It doesn't matter what your former mistakes were. Wherever you're coming from this journey, God wants to give you freedom. It's available to each and every one of us. So you might say, well, Steve, if that's true, though, why am I not experiencing it? I mean, I keep on thinking about the things that I know I shouldn't do, but I just can't get past them. But I want to give you a spiritual principle today that is so important. I promise you this is essential to victory in your life. And actually, we put it in your notes today so that you would have it there. That it's not enough to take out the bad. It's not enough to take out the sin. Christianity is not just a, 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 a religion where we just try and don't do the bad things, right? It's not enough to take out the bad, but we have to understand that God wants to replace it with something better. He wants to do a new work. Which is why Paul then makes another list. Not just the things that we need to find freedom from, but the things that we need to run to. Verse 12, he makes another list. Put on then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, that God wants to pour these things into our heart and life. The promise of Scripture is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, that God wants to make us into a new creation to renew us from the inside out. And though we're saved in a moment, this is an ongoing process. For most of us, we've been delivered in increments over time that God's working. He's implanting these new things in us, even as he's extracting these other things out of us. This is the work that he's doing in our life. Um, we are given this title of Christian when we put our faith in Jesus. But it's a title that we've got to grow into. 2010, I became a dad. So my, my son Caleb was born, my firstborn son. There in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And do you believe that two days after he was born, they tried to send him home with us? <laughs> it's the craziest thing. No idea. What, I'm like, y'all coming with us? I don't have any clue what I'm doing. And how many dads can testify that is the most nerve-wracking drive from the hospital to the house, right? You're driving like 25 miles an hour, got the blinkers on, waving. People go around. I got a baby on board, you know? Like, you're having a hard time there. I get through the door of the house. And they've got to change diapers. They've got to burp them. Oh, and by the way, teach him everything he's supposed to know for the rest of his life. That's a little intimidating, right? It's a little intimidating. And now I've got a few kids later, got four kids later, and I was given the title Dad in 2010. And I didn't know what to do, but it's something I've been growing into over the last eight years. And to the day I die, I'm still going to be growing into it, understanding what that looks like. Some of you all are parents, and your kids have gone out, they've flown the coop, but you're still Dad. And you're still mom, and you're still growing into what does this mean in this new season, right? It's an ongoing process. You need to know your faith is like that. It's ongoing. God wants to continue to give us freedom and continue pouring things into our lives. When you trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're given a new title. You know what it is? You are an adopted son or daughter of God Almighty. That's who you are. And God's going to spend the rest of your life and all eternity helping you to grow into that title helping you in that ongoing process of finding freedom. Here's the second way that we accelerate into the plans and the purposes that God has for us. Because listen, you can't do this on your own. You can't find freedom on your own. You can't grow and accelerate on your own. So we have to commit to community. To commit to community. Look what it says here in verse 13, Colossians 3. Bearing with one another, 
And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all else, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. There's so much here. I wish we could impact just the whole thing today. It's really, it's almost a sermon series to itself right there, just those few verses. But I want to point out one truth that we get from reading these verses that's really helpful for us today. I want you to notice all of the, the plural things he says in here. That we are supposed to be with one another. That we're supposed to forgive each other. That we are supposed to be bound together in perfect harmony. That we're part of one body. There's a lot of plural in there. And what Paul is suggesting to us is that we need to be part of a community that's encouraging each other to pursue Jesus. That if you want to accelerate in the plans that God has for you, the journey that he has for you, that's not something you can do alone. You need people with you along the journey. Somewhere along the way, we got this idea that the Christian walk is supposed to be this solitary journey. It's just me and Jesus, and we're on this long, narrow road winding on. But you need to know that's not what God intended. He intended for us to be brothers and sisters, shoulder to shoulder, marching together. That if one of us stumbles, we all get down and lift that brother or sister up and keep going together as we're all pursuing Jesus. We need to commit to community. It was uh, uh, several years ago that I had the opportunity to travel down to Venezuela. Uh, my buddy Zach, his parents were missionaries down there, um, and we thought we'd go down there together. So me and Zach and John and my, and my best friend Steve, we went down to Venezuela. We went to the capital city of Caracas, and there in Caracas it's in a valley, and it's surrounded on all sides by mountains. And we thought, let's do something brilliant. Let's climb a mountain. Y'all, I'm from central Florida. The highest thing I've ever climbed is a sand dune, right? But we decided we were going to climb this mountain, right? So we got out there with our bottle of water in our backpack, and we decided we were going to make the trek up. And we made it pretty far. Uh, and we actually got to the place where we were looking down on the skyscrapers, right? We were pretty high up there on these switchbacks going back and forth. But the, the portion of the trail that we were on had caved in. And so we couldn't go any further, and we knew we had to turn around. And it was not more than about five minutes after we turned around that I lost my footing and I went over the edge. I got caught in a tree just off of that thing. My head was pointed towards the ground several feet below. My feet were pointed straight up in the air and I was no bueno, okay? I wasn't doing well. But my friends that were with me on the journey saved my life. See, Steve and John and Zach got together, they literally formed a human chain, got down off the pathway, grabbed my legs, and they pulled me back up to safety. I was so very glad that that day I wasn't doing the journey alone. You know, spiritually speaking, we can all find ourselves in that place. Every last one of us could stumble at any moment or walk through hardship, whether it's our fault or not our fault. Life's difficult. That's why it's a team sport. And we're supposed to have people with us on this journey. We need to commit to community. And you know, I can tell you, I told you, I've been around this church for, for more than 16 years now. I can tell you that this is a wonderful place to do that. I would encourage you today, you heard Jared mention earlier, go to the Discover membership class. Again, you're under no obligation. They'll even feed you lunch, right? Head out there after the service is over and say, hey, I want to go today. They'll make sure there's a place for you. Find a place where you can plug in, a church you can plug into. This would be a great place to start. Others of you need to be part of a small group. You're a member here, but you're not really a part of a, a community group, a connect group, and you need to get plugged in that way. You know, the last time that we were in town, my wife and I uh, made a decision. We said, you know, while we're here, let's go to a, a small group. We went to Glenn and Chrissy Ryan's group, and it was wonderful. I mean, it was so refreshing. We lived off the encouragement from that for weeks afterwards. Just being in a room where we're sitting there, and we're hearing somebody else talk about where they're at, and then we felt like this, I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one that we're all walking through this together. It's so encouraging. Get a part of a small group where you can study God's word, be an encouragement to each other, pray for each other, and do life with other people. Get a part of a small group. Commit to community. So we're going to find freedom. We're going to commit to community. But then also, thirdly, we need to do this. We need to get wisdom from the word. We need to get wisdom from the word. Look what it says in the first half of verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, 
teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. This is so important. Let's break down these few verses, or these few words here, so you can understand exactly what Paul is talking about here. He says, "Let the word of Christ." He's talking about God's word. He says, "Let it dwell. Let it dwell within us." That word dwell right there, it's not just that it's bouncing around in our, our brains, that we've kind of read it, our verse for the day or whatever that is. That word dwell there means to put it within us so that it may influence us, so that it may actually affect the way that we live. And then it says that we need to do this richly, richly. We need to allow God's word to be within us richly. That word could also be translated abundantly. That this isn't something we can do once a week. Not something we can do, kind of snacking here and there. No, every day we need a full meal of God's word, pouring it into our lives abundantly that it may influence us so that it may be useful for teaching and admonishing so that we may gain wisdom. Listen, this is the true source for all wisdom that you need in life. It's right here. There's no circumstance you could face in life that God's word cannot address and give you wisdom to understand. And if we're going to accelerate into God's, um, God's plan, His journey for us, then we have to spend time in the Word. And, and that means we can't just disengage and do this passively. You kind of come and you read a verse and you kind of say, check, God, aren't you proud of me for, for, for reading my verse of the day? No, we have to bring all of our life, all of our circumstances, all of our everything to God's Word and say, God, would you speak? Hey, when you open up God's Word, do you expect it to say something to you? Do you expect to hear from him? He wants to speak, but we've got to come expectant to it. So I've told you I've got four kids, and we're in a season of parenting right now that may be a little difficult. Can we do a little group counseling here just for a minute? We can all do this together, okay? Let's just all join this together, okay? A little group counseling. We're in a season of parenting that's a little difficult. Maybe you've experienced this too, where our kids will ask us a question, and then we will answer the question, and then they will have become distracted, and they'll say, what? After we've answered it. Have you all ever experienced that before, right? So, Dad, what's for dinner? Oh, we're having spaghetti. What? I said we're having spaghetti. I, you just asked me a question. I already feel better talking about this openly with you all today. Thank you so much <laughs> for hearing me out on this. This is so good. And it's so funny because they're asking a question they really do want an answer to, but they get distracted, squirrel, and they don't hear the answer. I wonder sometimes if our Heavenly Father feels that way. God, give me wisdom, give me discernment, give me direction. I need your guidance, Lord. And then he tries to speak through his word, but we're just not hearing what he's saying. Because we're not coming expectant. And we're not trying to gain wisdom for the word to allow it to actually influence our lives. We've got to get wisdom from the word, we've got to really dig into it and allow it to speak to who we are and what our life is about. So we're going to find freedom. We're going to commit to community. We're going to get wisdom from the word. And then here's the last thing right here. We need to invite God's presence with praise. We need to invite God's presence with praise. I love this, how he finishes out here in these last verse and a half. Second half of verse 16, he says, We need to be singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And then in verse 17, he says, And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. That through singing, through our words, through our deeds, through everything, literally through all that God's given us in this life, that we have the opportunity to worship God, to praise Him. And that when we sing, when we truly worship Him with our lives, that then we are literally inviting His presence into our lives. You know the Bible says in Psalms, the psalmist says this, he says, did you know that God, when we lift you up, that you're enthroned on the praises of your people? In other words, God inhabits the praises of of his people. Did you know that the Bible says that if you're experiencing the heaviness, the Bible says the garment of heaviness, you should put on the garment of praise so that you can experience God's presence in your life. That Lord, the Lord promises to be with us when we will choose to pursue him in praise, pursue him in worship. Well, I'm not much of a singer, Pastor Steve. Well, that's okay. I'm not much of a singer either. That's why the Bible says joyful noises are okay, right? It's all good. And that's why he also says it's not just through singing, it's through your words, through your deeds, through your life, through your everything. You have the opportunity to invite God's presence by the way that you praise him, to pursue him in worship. For more than a decade, I had the opportunity 
to serve in student ministry. And I still do a fair amount of student ministry. Know the students in our church and know the young men in our church. And I'm sure that this is not true of the young men in this church, but in our church, I just want to let you know, it's a little depressing the way that the young men in our church pursue trying to get a date. It's just sad, really. They got no clue. So prom just happened uh, in Birmingham, uh, where we're at, our little section of the town there. And I came up to a group of guys, and I asked them about prom. And pretty much the entire conversation went like this. I was like, hey, so did you, did you have a date to the prom? Well, no. I asked a girl, but she said no. Well, well, tell me, how did you ask her? Well, I texted her. Mistake number one. <laughs> well, what did you text her when you asked her? Well, I texted her, and I was like, hey, you want to go to prom or not? Whatever. It's totally casual. Mistake number two right there. Well, then what did she text you back? And she said, I don't know. So then what did you say? I didn't say anything back. I just ghosted her. I didn't even text her back. Mistake number three, right there. And I look at these guys, and I'm like, I hope that your parents are okay with their family name dying with your generation, because you're never getting married, much less getting a date to the prom, all right? It's crazy. Because you cannot have a relationship unless you're willing to pursue the other person. Hear me what I'm saying? You cannot have the presence of the Lord in your life unless you're willing to pursue Him with praise. We've got to pursue Him. Go after Him. Because when we do that, He promises His presence to us. Invite God's presence with praise. And you know, If you were to read the rest of Colossians 3, here's what you would discover. That when we do these things, when we find freedom, when we get wisdom from the Word, when we commit to communion, when we invite God's presence with praise, you would discover that Paul says, then what happens is, it will touch your marriage. And it will touch the way that you have a relationship with your kids. And it will touch your work relationships. And it will touch everything about you. It will transform you. And it then will transform the lives of other people through you. That this literally is life-changing when we pursue God and accelerate into the journey He has for us in these ways. So do you want to be close to God? Do you want to find freedom? Do you want to experience wisdom? And to know that you're never alone, that the community is around you. Do you want to experience God's presence in a unique way? It's all available to you. It's all available to you. You just have to choose to take the journey. Accelerate the plans, the purposes that God has for you. But I want to say this to you, and this is so important. Don't miss this part. I want to point you back to the first word of the first verse. Look at what it says right there. If. If. This is only available to you if you've been raised with Christ, if you know Jesus. This amazing adventure, this journey, the plans, the purposes, everything that God has for you, it's only available if you know Jesus. And if you're here today and you don't know Him, but you say, I really do, I really do want to know God in that way, then that's available to you. Let me tell you how. You see, you have to understand, even as I've talked about earlier in this message, That Jesus died and was resurrected for you. You say, what what does that have to do with me? Well, you know, we all struggle with this thing called sin. Sin is disobeying God in any way, shape, or form. I'm a sinner. Um, The pastor of this church is a sinner. I hope he doesn't mind me saying that, right? I mean, we've got sinners, all of us. We all struggle to obey God. And because of that, that carries with it a penalty. And the penalty for that is, in fact, death and forever separation from God. But because of God's great love for you, Jesus stepped out of heaven. God's one and only son came to this earth, lived a perfect life, and he said, I'll die your death in your place on the cross. Three days later, he was risen from the grave. He conquered hell, death, the grave, and your sin. The Bible tells us that because he has done that, he now offers to you a free gift that is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. A life knowing God, a life knowing God in this life and the life to come. That's what God offers you. But it's a gift, and a gift has to be received, right? So if you're here today and you say, I do want to know God, you have to receive the gift that Jesus is offering to you. So you come to God and you simply say, God, I know I'm a sinner. 
but I believe that you died on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin, that you are alive, and I surrender my life to you and ask for your forgiveness. If you would do that today in the genuineness of your heart, then I believe, based upon the testimony of God's word and what God has done in my own life, that God would hear your prayer and he would save you today. So why don't we do this? Let's bow our heads. Let's close our eyes for just a moment. I want to give that opportunity for anybody in this room that knows they need to know Jesus today. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And you can use these words to express your heart to God. Now, I just want to make sure you understand this. Don't just repeat what I'm saying up here. If you repeat this prayer without really meaning it, just saying the words the guy up front saying, it's kind of meaningless. But if you're here today and you say, I really do believe that Jesus has done these things for me. I really do want to surrender my life to him and ask for his forgiveness. You can use these words. Make them your own. And God would hear you today. So if you're ready to know Jesus today, pray this silent in your heart as I pray it out loud. Pray something like this. God, I know that I am a sinner and that I have disobeyed you. But I believe that you paid the penalty for my sin by dying on the cross. I believe that you rose from the grave, that you are alive, and that I can have a relationship with you. And so right now, I just ask for your forgiveness. And right now, I surrender my life to you. I turn it all over to you. Help me to know you and to accelerate in the journey that you have for me. Heads bowed, eyes closed all across this room. If you just prayed that prayer for the first time or the first time that you meant it, I want to let you know that you just made one of the best decisions of your entire life. We want to celebrate that with you in just a moment. We're going to have a time of invitation. And it's not the kind of thing where we're going to put a spotlight on you or a microphone in your face or march you up here on this stage, nothing like that. But myself and a few other leaders in the church, Pastor Mike, we're going to be up here at the front. And if you've made that decision today, I want to invite you to come to the front and let somebody know, yeah, today was the day that I gave my life to Jesus. We just want to celebrate with you, pray with you, and help you take some next steps on the journey. Maybe you need to be baptized. Go public with that. Others of you here today, and even as I've been talking through this message, you're like, man, that's the thing that I need to do. I need to get connected to community, but I'm not sure where to start. You come. We'd love to help you get connected. You're here today. I, I, need, to, I need to get some things off of my chest. I need to find freedom in some areas of my life that I'm struggling with. You come. We want to pray for you. Whatever it is that God's speaking to your heart, this is going to be the time for you to come for you to be prayed for, and for us to rally around you to take the next steps that God has for you. I'm going to pray a final blessing over us. Then we're going to stand and we're going to sing. And you come. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your promises and your word. We thank you that you've not only given us a way to be saved, 